Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com uh, Artist Review, yes, part two. Uh, quickly though, I'm going to do say a couple things and show a couple things before I get into the where I left off. I left off from 1974, I believe, Relayer, like a month ago. Um, I'm gonna do a video, I think, about the solo stuff after this, just because I have more vinyl from that to show, I guess. Uh, from the Yes members. Um, I also, in the last video, said I didn't have a copy of Time in a Word, and I thought I did. I did. This is, of course, the copy with Steve Howell on the cover. Steve Howell did not play on Time in a Word, the second Yes album. But, uh, yeah, it was just in a different stack when I originally made that video last month. Kind of a cool jacket that it came with, also. Um, this is a later issue, and that's probably why it ended up with a weird cover with the wrong... <laughs> with Steve Howe, not... Uh, uh, Peter Banks, um, but this jacket is kind of cool. It shows a lot of different records on this. It's Cotillon, I think it is. It's just Cotillon Rock, which is part of Atlantic and Adco. Uh, Close to the Edge is on here, Fragile. From Yes, then you have like Led Zeppelin 3, as you can see. And some ELP, like the first ELP album, and then pictures of at an exhibition. Some Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Stephen Stills. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of Dr. John, uh, The Rascals. There's some interesting stuff. King Crimson's uh, Islands record. So, sleeves that used to cover other albums from this label or whatever they recommend. They used to come on vinyls, but it's like vinyl you buy now doesn't really typically do that so much. Maybe it does, I just don't remember it. So, all right, so in 74, they did a tour in 75, but... Um, of course, Patrick Moraz played on the Real Art album. He left. I think he may have joined the Moody Blues at that point. I'm not sure, but he was with the Moody Blues at one point. Um, at least one point. But they got Rick Wakeman to come back, and then they eventually made Going for the One, which is a record that a lot of Yes fans really enjoy. A lot of them prefer to relayer. Here's my copy. It's, this is, what, a Atlantic... I don't know if this is a, this is even a first pressing, probably not, but um, this album features the epic uh, Awaken, which when I first got into Yes about 15 years ago, I mean, I, I knew about them before that, but um, I, I, re I did enjoy that piece, um, and it has its moments, but it's a cool gatefold, by the way. I am not as all gung-ho about it as a lot of people are, though. I think the biggest reason why is sort of the I get this cheesy, almost kind of over overtly spiritual um, process with the the church organ. A lot of it was recorded, I believe, in a church, or at least written, if not recorded. I think it was it was recorded in a church, and it just rubbed me the wrong way. And to this day, at that and close to the edge, it's why Wakeman is not a keyboardist I revere quite as much as other keyboardists. I still enjoy a lot of his work, but. That and some of the like close to the edge is, is, has always kind of bugged me, and I've never really been in love with uh, Awaken. But you know, I guess I could probably isolate certain parts I still like. And it has its moments. I like the piano, the but you know the church organ, eh. and some of John Anderson's sort of you know overtly uh, pr I don't really call it preachy, but um, it's like out of body experience. It's it's a little just too almost too religious to me, even though it's not religious. Um, Anyway, of course, uh, Going for the One has the radio uh, track Wonder Stories, which is a nice ballady kind of track. It's not really fast or anything, but it's uplifting. Most of this record is uplifting in a lot of ways. Um, the title track has that twangy, almost country feel guitar. It's pedal steel, I believe, steel guitar, which, of course, Steve Howe was playing a lot on, on Relayer, like uh, To Be Over. It kind of carried over to this, <laughs> no pun intended, um, and I like going for the one. I kind of almost was thinking it's a little bit like Hot Dog from Led Zeppelin, although it's not quite as overtly country. Michael Nesmith, though, I was thinking, just thinking about that style of music, would have, uh, it kind of, maybe they, maybe Steve Howe was listening to Michael Nesmith when he wrote that, I don't know. But the two biggest highlights to me are Turn of the Century and Parallels. Turn of the Century is just a perfect, mesmerizing ballad. And like Genesis's Ripples, uh, I got into that song first from hearing Annie Haslam singing on the Yes Tribute album, Tales from Yesterday, with Steve Howe of all people, which is kind of weird how Steve Howe was playing on a Yes Tribute album, but, um, yeah, it's, it's the lyrics and 
uh, just sort of the the arrangement is just wonderful. It's one of the best yes ballads they ever made, they ever recorded, or wrote. Um, talk about clay transforming. It's almost like an escape song. Uh, in his room, his lady, she would dance and sing so completely. So so be still. He now cries. I have time. I'll let clay transform thee. It's almost yeah. It's like a I don't know. It's it's like a fairy tale, almost like a some kind of fairy tale. Rowan, uh, no more. Yeah, it's got a depressing sort of, you know, melancholy element to it. Anyway, in parallels, good track, upbeat, catchy, um, kind of progressive with some time changes. It's you know, it harkens back to some of you know the, the earlier '70s. Yes, you know, uh, not roundabout so much, but a little bit. Anyway, so then the year after, I believe it was, they released a Tormato, or to Tomato, with a different spelling. Again, with the same lineup, with John Anderson, of course, and Rick Wakeman still was on this album. Uh, this is probably considered by a lot of people as the worst sort of classic Yes, 70s Yes album, which, you know, I, I, I can understand that, and... Uh, I would not call it overrated, though, but um, the way I kind of consider um, Close to the Edge a little overrated, but um, I don't have the track that's on here. I, I guess I, it is kind of, it's almost like from Genesis, the uh, like Wind and Weathering. It, it has some songs I like. The, the, the Release, Release, and Don't Kill the Whale, those two songs kind of stand out the most. Um, Let's see here. Arriving UFOs is okay. It's interesting. Circus of Heaven. Uh, on the Silent Wounds of Freedom is sort of, a, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of an epic. And honestly, I've listened to this album less than ten times. Because I remember when I was getting into the, the later Yes, and I just, I, I, I bought it, I checked it out. Yeah, Silent Wounds of Freedom is like 7.45. They do Onward, this is four minutes, which is weird. I'm looking for Onward. Onward must be an instrumental... Is it? No, it isn't. Um, but the lyrics are just kind of simplistic. Onward through the night, onward through the night, <laughs> onward through the night of my life. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't have a ton to say about this record. Release, release, and Madrigal, too. That's a nice ballad. Which Rush, of course, released a song called Madrigal the year before. I find it ironic. Uh, release, release, of course. I, again, I think about that Yes Tribute album that kind of got me more into the band, actually, in the late 90s. And I picked that up. Mid-90s. Um, Shadow Gallery does a very cool version of this song. And so I, it's sometimes the case where you hear a cool cover, you go back and discover the original and enjoy it more. But, but it was a weird time for Yes because I don't think... I don't know if Going for the One did quite... Even though they had Wonder Stories, did quite as well. And so this album... I don't know if there was as much effort and you know, believe, you know, time in, was put into this record, and which led to John Anderson leaving, which led to Rick Wakeman again leaving. Um, so it was just the three. It was Steve Howe, it was Chris Squire, and Alan White, of course. And of course, then we come to probably my second favorite Yes album, Drama, which I've got two copies, as you can see. Here's one. This is a promo gatefold. And if it wants to open... Which, of course, saw them with a new lead singer, Trevor Horn, of the Buggles. The Buggles had, not that long before they wrote this music, and probably writing at the same time, had the hit, it was in 79, Video Killed the Radio Star, right when, right when MTV launched? I thought MTV was in the early 80s, but anyway, it was the first song on MTV, I know that much. But this album kind of reinvigorated my, my interest in Yes, um, and... I'll admit that the reason why I got more into this record is because Dream Theater, in the early the mid '90s, they were at the Ryan Scott Jazz Club, and Steve Howe joined them, and they covered Machine Messiah, that, and then um, or part of it at least. And then they eventually did it in 2004 after I'd already gotten into this record when they toured with Yes. Um, but then it also has Into the Lens, unbelievably just catchy, memorable progressive track, even though it has a little bit of an 80s tinge, it does kind of sound like if Buggles were doing, um, if Buggles were doing, uh, prog, basically, <laughs> but, uh, it's got that, that repeated line, I am a camera, 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 I am, but it's just the time changes and the segues are just 
I get goosebumps every time. I just love the whole the, the dynamics in that song. It's so good. The drumming, it's almost into the lens is a top five yes song for sure. It's one of the best progressive rock songs I've ever heard, actually. Machine Messiah, not to be dis not to just discount it, not to say very little about it, has a very cool heavy riff, like very metal almost. I almost think of drama, at least with Machine Messiah and some of the other parts of it, being prog metal. And that's kind of why I think it appealed to me. Um, but it also includes Tempest Fugit, which was, I think, a slight minor radio hit. I think at least among the record, this was that was the one track that they'd play even with Johnny Anderson. I don't think they ever played with Johnny Anderson, but they would play it at points when John Anderson was in the band, like ABW, I think, I don't know, Tempest Fugit was like the known track for this album. Uh, Run Through the Light, great track. Uh, Does It Really Happen, catchy, kind of good chorus. White Cars, kind of a little too short almost. And the thing I always think about this record too is when I got it, I got the, of course, remastered version, which does include a lot of bonus tracks and demos. And it, I would, there's a couple other versions of like Run Through the Light, which are just awesome. I, I absolutely lo adore drama. And despite the fact it has Jeff Downs and uh, Trevor Horn and doesn't have John Harris and Rick Wakeman, oh man, they were, it was all really kind of their back against the wall kind of thing and it totally worked. Unfortunately, it only was for one record and Trevor Horn, I can get this, um, pull up drama, the, the, the version of drama I just wanted to include, let's see here, the 2000, the whole bunch of them in here. This is the one right here. Oh, that's the Gatefold Limited Edition. It has it has a bunch of extra tones. I, I even couple of the demos with John Anderson, but um, I'm not gonna invest that much more time into talking about this record, even though this is, you know, clearly the, from this period of Yes's music and really since the classic period, the record that shines the most. Um, so then they released that was later. That was 1980. It was like August of '80, I guess. I looked it up. It was in November of 80, they released the Double Live album, it was Double, uh, Yes yeah, Shows, which um, covered a lot of the period with, um, a lot of this period, but it includes get the Gates of Delirium, so it goes back to the Relayer period, and it has Ritual, actually, too, so it's, it's again, a mixture of different um, periods of time, it's not all from, I don't know if it's all from one or two shows. That's why it's, it's plural. That's the, I think that's why they get the name Yes Shows. Why did this come out like this? That was... I hope I didn't just screw this up and get a fingerprint on it, but... Yeah, and the thing about this record is, from a set list standpoint, well, Yes Songs versus Yes Shows. My favorite Yes album is, is uh, Relayer. So this has The Gates of Delirium. I just, you know, when The Gates of Delirium, hearing it live just... And it has Patrick Moraz on it. It never fully um, blew me away. And I just, this, it's a studio experiment, basically. I concluded that. It's, it's okay, and I, I'll, I'll admit that I wish I had been able to see it when they played The Gates of Delirium on the Masterworks or on the Symphonic Tour. I think they played it as well. I was kind of tight for money and not as much into Yes. I liked Yes at that point, but I wish I had. I didn't think The Gates of Delirium would be going away. Um, but. It's, it's a decent live record among their live albums. It would be in the middle. It's not, I wouldn't, I definitely not from a performance standpoint, a memorability and interesting sort of take on these live songs. And I love Ritual too from Tales from Topographic Oceans, but it's my favorite track from that, that, that album that only has four songs. But it just is a kind of, a, I wouldn't call it slightly disappointing, but just sort of okay live album that would be worth listening to if you can't see them live, I actually am not going to be able to see the, more, the drama tour they're doing right now, and it would be worth seeing some of this other drama stuff live, and of course there was nothing from drama on that, but um, if you haven't seen the, the stuff off that, you know, live, it would be worth seeing, but anyway, then I, I do have this compilation, which, called Classic Yes, which, from a standpoint, if I just wanted to listen to a record of a bunch of different Yes songs, I suppose it would be worth having it. Heart of the Sunrise, Yours No Disgrace, uh, and You and I, Long Distance Running Around, Trap Trip Trooper. I mean, it's it's a nice compilation and wondrous stories. It's a nice compilation. The thing I think that was cool is I got this seven-inch single of um, Roundabout, which you don't see. Yes, forty-five for I've seen all good people. So it's I've seen all. This must have been released sometime in the mid '70s then, because obviously they were not on the same album. But 
whoever sold this when I got it um, included that that seven inch. Maybe someone who was like who like fall out of love with the yes and said I don't like yes. I want to get get rid of all my yes stuff in one swoop. But yeah, I mean I you know I only I mainly bought it because I think it was pretty cheap. I paid only a couple bucks for it and it included the. Uh, Having this, the being a, a yes fanatic somewhat myself to have the uh, the seven inch included, although I wish it would have had artwork, of course. So that came out in '81. So I don't have a copy of 90125. Um, I'll just say with 90125, the song um, changes. I've always liked. It. I always liked the version that Enchant did for the Yes tribute album, but you tell us from yesterday. But as a whole, though, Owner of Lonely Heart, fine song, heard it a million times. The rest of the record, when I first got it on CD, I paid, I think, a buck for it at, a, like, a record show. I could not stand it. And, I mean, I could probably go for revisiting Owner of a Lonely Heart, or 90125, rather. But, and Trevor Rabin was on it, of course. And so I, and I did pick up, then, Big Generator. I can't even believe I paid, it says $3 on the sticker. This, oh, yeah, this album, much like 90125 and... Uh, even talk when I bought that on CD did next to nothing for me. I mean, it has rhythm of love. I knew that from a compilation I had, um, and it has shoot high, aim low. But you know, the stuff since drama really from Yes, it's been very spotty. Not, I'm not saying there isn't anything. I don't have all my CDs in front of me to show. It's my copy of Big Generator though. It's kind of funny. The the jacket says nine zero five two two one. So I wonder if that that was either. Uh, like a serial number or a zip code again, or was it a reference to the previous album? Because Big, Big Generator 90125 came out, I think, in '83. Of course, Owner of Lonely Heart was on the radio, probably in rotation for for many years, high rotation probably for a year or two. You know, you'd be hearing Michael Jackson in print, then you hear that. I can't get this sucker inside. But um, this came out, Big Generator, when was that? '80. It was the fun, I mean, because 90125 was so successful with Owner of Lonely Heart. 87, wow, that was a few years back. And it's kind of interesting because the cover I've got on this one is green, but the, the cover they show here is a yellow cover, which I guess it was a little bit like King's X's Dog Man. So I'll just, just gloss over here slightly. Union, I got that on CD. Remember when I was trying to check out Yes? The first song, like, We're Gonna Live Forever, I remember. The rest of it is terrible, I guess. The Union tour, however, was excellent, I guess, and I... I've always wanted to hear like an official live recording of that. I'm sure there are some. Just because you have whatever it is, eight musicians doing all that music. Um, something like that. Maybe even more than that. Talk. A lot of people love that epic uh, Endless Dream. I have that on CD. You know, I listen to that maybe once or twice. The artwork is kind of stupid. But um, I have never spent gone back to it because I was so turned off by Big Generator, by 90125, and even I was related to like, the Asia stuff I was checking out from Steve Howe. I just, I didn't have time for it, and so, you know, I should check out at least Endless Dream, which is the epic, you know, whatever it is, 13 minutes, but the rest of it, The Calling, these other songs I don't even know, and they're kind of forgettable, um, and I think with Talk, with Steve Howe back in the band, he might have been, their lineup changes were so significant, Raven, no, it was, no, Tony K was back in the 80s, of course, um, so, but yeah, it was still Trevor Raven, he kind of had a, uh, a residency with Yes for over a decade. Um, then Open Your Eyes, 97, which was the first like new Yes album when I sort of started to become a fan. Also, I saw him on that tour. Terrible record. <laughs> the title track was sort of silly, I guess mem somewhat memorable, but um, New State of Mind. I even bought the Surround Sound version because I thought that was when Surround Sound was really new, a special version that would sound different on your stereo. And I was working at Best Buy at the time, and I, I could get a deal on all that stuff. So, But in 99, they released The Ladder. The Ladder was a, was a much, was a breath of fresh, fresh air, basically. It was the first, like, newer Yes-related album that I um, liked. And I got more into it as time went by. Uh, favorites, Face to Face, If Only You Knew, um, let's see, let's see, Homeworld, uh, The Messenger, Nine Voices. It's a, I guess to describe the latter is it's an album that doesn't have any just amazing songs, but every track has got something, whether it be an energetic part, some kind of cool instrumental part. It's not the, it's not prog, like there aren't any prog epics on this. I think the longest song is, well, there's the new language, which is nine minutes. But other than that, 
Oh, the opening track. Okay, I take that back. But I just, I just remember this this album like thinking it was so much better than the other stuff I had heard previously. Um, but yeah, I mean the latter. If I could find it on vinyl, I probably would buy it on vinyl. I think I did see it once on vinyl, but it was not cheap. I would spend fifteen bucks easily on vinyl for it. Maybe someday I'll find it. I also should backtrack slightly. ABWH is another album I have on CD, and it kind of like the latter, where it was it had some good songs on it, but nothing exceptional. Um, but it, you know, of course, it had Bill Bruford returning to Yes for the first time. Right, that was right before Union, and Union had him as well. But that was a ABWH is vastly better than Union, but again, we're talking about terrible to medi mediocre. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say of the latter Yes albums, latter is the best. The other one that to, to not discount or forget about is um, the kind of half studio, half live, Keys to Ascensions. Well, Keys to Ascension 2, I believe it is. Yes, yep. And Keys to Ascension 2 has Mind Drive. Mind Drive is the best Yes epic since anything off of drama. I will st stand by this. It's like Close to the Edge or In You and I or even Rich. It's very well composed. It has that classic Yes feel. And um, another album that they'd ever release on vinyl, I would snatch up. It, the, the rest of this album has a couple other songs, it's including Children of Light, which is a suite, and Bring Me to the Power, um, Footprints, a bunch of longer tracks, Sign Language. Mind Drive is really where you're where you're, that's the the, uh, the value is on this album, and my computer one is frozen up. Of course, it's got the first side, which is live in San Luis Obispo, which has Close to the Edge, Turn the Century, and You and I, I've Seen All Good People, and Going for the One, and Time and a Word. Nice set list, but a lot of standard classic stuff, that nothing extraordinary. So, then they released Magnification, just to kind of wrap this up, in 2001, with Alan White playing the keyboards. They didn't have Rick Wakeman, they didn't have Tony Kay, they didn't have uh, Igor Koroshev, I know, was their sort of touring keyboardist, but he didn't play on this. And eventually he was asked to leave for various reasons. Um, and I don't hate this album, but the latter is a better record to me. It's more symphonic, though. And I, again, between the latter and this, I haven't listened to this even as much as the latter. But the title track, I remember when I was on KFEI, we played some of the stuff. Dream Time is a 10 minute song, almost 11 minute song. Can you imagine? Give love each day. This the problem is a lot of the latter yes since drama they just write these sort of songs with themes that are sort of happy go lucky sort of spiritually kind of preachy almost and they're not as they don't reach me on sort of a melancholy realistic sort of uh, I don't get I don't get as much move I don't get, I don't get moved by them <laughs> nearly as much and it just doesn't have that sort of magic that I loved about their 70s stuff but um, the latter. You know, Mind Drive being an exception. The two albums that have come back out since, that I'm not going to forget, Fly From Here in Heaven and Earth. Fly From Here was sort of interesting since it was derived from a piece they never recorded for drama, but they actually demoed. The guy, they, Benoit David or David, was okay, but I liked it initially and I just kind of got bored with it. And I mean, it's it's not awful, but I would say it's no better than Magnification. Maybe, maybe slightly, but... And Heaven and Earth, honestly, with John Davison, is pretty forgettable. Again, the suffer what the latter yes suffered from. It's like stripped down AOR attempts at prog almost. It's you know, I applaud them for still trying to write and record music. It's too bad that Chris Squire's never gonna be on another studio album that we know of unless it's been recorded. But um, you know, would I rather have them do nothing? Probably not. It's still good to have them make new music, but Anyway, that's as a whole. What's your favorite Yes album, or the later Yes album? What's your take on drama? Um, and I'll just announce coming up next, besides the solo stuff from Yes members, I have um, King Crimson, Renaissance, uh, what else? I gotta finish up Rush and Queen, and, and some other projects I'm thinking about. So thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and comment if you want.